It won't be until 1979, three years after Mao dies, that China will become legitimized in the eyes, in the world's eyes by President Jimmy Carter. At this point, thanks to wars breaking out in the South Pacific, socialism was eroding. Legitimizing China was a terrifying decision. The military industrial complex actually penned a letter to Carter telling him to reverse course on this decision and how China was a victim of socialist or, or rather Soviet imperialism. And I, for one, am shocked to learn that the military industrial complex is literate. I mean, did you guys know they could read? That is amazing. Good for them. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Forkful of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Before we get into this episode, I want to let you guys know that if you want to be in the virtual audience for one of these recordings, you can do so by getting a ticket uh, on the last Thursday of every single month where I do these Zoom shows and it's a new show every month talking about another kind of big sociopolitical topic. So if you're interested in that last Thursday of every month, you can grab your tickets, come join us in the Zoom virtual theater and be a part of these Forkful of Noodles recordings. You can find that ticket information over on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. While you're there, you can check out all of my stand-up comedy albums, you can check out past episodes of this show, my interview show, Taboo Table Talk, and the live stream, more riffy show that I do about current events and news stories called Road Reflections. Again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. And if you're interested in, in supporting this show financially, you can do so on the website as well by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member and making monthly contributions. To those that are already making monthly contributions, I really, really appreciate you guys and you guys help make this show better with each contribution. All right, now let's get right into the episode. China. This is probably one of the most controversial topics to discuss in capitalist America. If you bring up China at a party, I mean, that's it, right? The night is over. Everyone has to go home because it's sure to turn into a screaming match about who read the most accurate headline about China that day, right? And a lot of Americans don't even really understand why they're supposed to hate China other than the fact that they're commie reds that are coming to suck the soul out of every Christian baby in America. But capitalists like George Soros have called China an existential competitor to the United States. But wait a minute, isn't competition good for capitalism? I mean, that's what's preached to us nonstop by the simps of the system. So why would it be bad to have a competitor? I mean, shouldn't that mean that America is pushed to produce better things? Shouldn't that mean that America should be trying to be as good, if not better, than a society in, than China? I mean, China's Common Prosperity Program is des described as, quote, not good for investors. And as capitalist business leaders in America describe China as an existential threat, capitalist politicians are pushing for a full-on hot war with China. The United States has two partnerships that militaristically are threatening China. The Quad, consisting of the U.S., Australia, Japan, and India, and AUKUS, which consists of the U.S., the U.K., and Australia. And yes, it also sounds like a species of platypus that is just really socially awkward. Also, does anyone else feel like the U.S. is trying to fuck Australia? I mean, look, I get it. Australia was a British prison colony, and everybody loves a bad boy that their parents are going to hate. Plus, they got a pretty cool accent, you know, and militarism is the only way America knows how to flirt. Want to see how far I can fly my drone? 
hey, is that a nuclear sub in your pants or are you just excited for imperialism? I bet the size of my Navy gets your inland real wet. Right now, China has a 20% favorability rating among average Americans. But this is the hypocritical way liberals behave towards this giant, right? They claim China is evil and violates human rights, but we should stop spreading Asian hate, you guys. It's just a, a lot of mixed signals. So what's behind all this hatred and hypocrisy? In order to understand that, we'd have to delve into the history of China and Americans' involvement in their growth. China's main goal since the revolution that put the Communist Party in power back in 1949 is to build a socialist society. In the early part of the 20th century, thanks to British imperialism and the opium trade, China lost a lot of power in the global markets. The Brits had embarrassed this once proud nation with unbeatable dynasties by essentially turning them into a drug mule. They were basically like a college student that loses all their money in Mexico and has to transport cocaine in their butt to get home. Plus, after the Japanese invasion during World War II, China, China was torn apart by the ravages of war. 30 million Chinese lives were lost in the 14 years of warfare they faced. So after the communists won the revolution in 1949, it was time to rebuild the country. And China's economy was weak. Mao Zedong's goal was to eradicate poverty from China. But Mao also had to keep the nation unified. So in order to help this socialist project get off the ground, he turned to Joseph Stalin, which, look, I get that looks bad. But lest we forget, without Stalin's help, the U.S. and the Allied forces wouldn't have beat Hitler in World War II. The problem with Stalin was that he wasn't ready to turn into a capitalist state after the war. Mao and Stalin primarily talk about peace. And look, again, I, I get that it's hard to believe that someone like Joseph Stalin would want to talk about peace. But, eh, you know, maybe that was because he was older and the Nazis didn't really seem like that much of a problem at that time. Right. I get it. You know, I'm older now, you know, and I only want to burn things down like 60 percent of the time. But Stalin agreed to help China by sending scientists, technology and resources to help get their economy off the ground. By the first year, Mao overturned several marriage laws that were in place from the old regime. In 1950, the marriage law, one of the first uh, laws that was enacted by the PRC was this marriage law that looked at this basically centuries long of feudal patriarchal marriages and then ending a lot of the most brutal practices, which is child marriage, arranged marriages, uh, banned polygamy that was only allowed for men, uh, and 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 allow and also mandated the actual registration of um, of uh, marriages that also allowed women to to be human beings, you know, as individuals, yeah. human beings, but also a possibility to exit divorce, to leave their uh, their you know possibly abusive or whatever marriages they were in. So that's I mean one of the first things that ex was experienced in, under the PRC. On top of that, more hospitals were being built and Mao focused his attention on agriculture. In the 50s, the U.S. slapped sanctions on China because they supported the Korean independence rather than U.S. imperialism. Tensions started to build between the Soviets and the Chinese, and they only get worse when Stalin dies and Khrushchev takes over. Both nations wanted the same thing, a sovereign socialist state but were bickering over the execution of the plan. The Soviets believed that China was moving too fast. But by 1959, things were reaching a boiling point between the two socialist giants. Now, Khrushchev met with U.S. President Eisenhower, who was looking to end the Cold War by making an arms deal with the Soviets. Eisenhower also wanted to deal with the, quote, China problem. At this point, the U.S. had toyed with the idea of dropping a nuke on Taiwan to cripple China. I mean, isn't it funny that the only country that used nukes and then threatened another country to use nukes 
is the only one claiming that we need to rein in certain countries with nuclear capabilities. I mean, shouldn't the rest of the world be trying to rein in the nuke-thirsty U.S. empire? Boy, if sense was common. Now, Mao and the Chinese see making amends with an imperial power as a betrayal to the construction of a socialist society. So they started writing about how the Soviets were imperialist and socialist posers. Like, yo, do you even like dis- redistribute, bro? Okay, do you even lift the working class out of poverty and share the means of production with them? Bro, like, do you even live the revolution? So the Soviets responded by abruptly calling all of those scientists back and cutting off resources and advancements to China. Khrushchev went against the first principle of socialism. Sharing is caring. Apparently, he no longer cared. During this period is also when the Sino-Soviet split uh, was happening. And so, you know, in the late 50s till early 61, you actually had overnight thousands of experts, agricultural experts, industrial experts, hundreds of projects, development projects that stopped overnight. Soviet Union withdrew them all in a night. And of course, then the country had to go and repay its debt quickly. So there was a huge amount of conjuncture of factors um, that was at play that did um, have a uh, role in playing in terms of people being hungry and people starving in a history where this has been the history of my people has been dealing with how to feed that many people. The Soviet scientists were very confused about this decision. This was rather devastating to the socialist cause, right? This is like watching two best buds throwing their friendship away because they can't agree on who the best X-Man is. The answer is Gambit, obviously. The answer is Gambit's the best X-Man. He's, he's, he's great. He's great. Look, I'll prove it. This is Gambit as a Funko Pop, and he's got a cat. I mean, the ba- do you really think a bad guy would have a cat? Come on! That is just ridiculous. Look, this was a catastrophe for China. With crippling U.S. sanctions and the loss of the Soviet support, China's burgeoning socialist economy was collapsing. With all that and Mao's strict new agricultural law, China saw a wave of starvation in the early 60s, and things only got worse in this decade. A quick, a quick, quick side note here. I know Mao's wave of starvation is used by capitalists as a proof of the failures of socialism, but that argument disregards the sanctions and the Soviet support. But more importantly, it ignores the consistent wave of homelessness and starvation in capitalist nations like the U.S. Don't forget, thanks to how U.S. capitalism dealt with the pandemic, homelessness and starvation rose in the last two years, and capitalism has yet to deal with those issues. And not only did America invade Vietnam and bringing war to the doorsteps of China, they had to deal with border skirmishes between India and the Soviet Union in the 60s as well. But this gave America's oldest living war criminal, Henry Kissinger, the perfect opportunity to take out both the Southeast Asian and Eastern European socialist blocs. He had a simple plan. Quote, we want both sides to kill each other. Now, after meeting Mao in secret, Kissinger arranged for Nixon to meet him publicly in 1975. This was Nixon trying to regain goodwill in the eyes of the international community after the blunders of Vietnam. This was him subtly saying, I am not a crook. In in regular English and not Nixonian English, that translates to I, I, I am not a crook just in case anybody couldn't re- hear through the jowls. It won't be until 1979, three years after Mao dies, that China will become legitimized in the eyes, in the world's eyes by President Jimmy Carter. At this point, thanks to wars breaking out in the South Pacific, socialism was eroding. Legitimizing China was a terrifying decision. The military industrial complex actually penned a letter to Carter telling him to reverse course on this decision 
and how China was a victim of socialist or, or rather Soviet imperialism. And I, for one, am shocked to learn that the military industrial complex is literate. I mean, did you guys know they could read? That is amazing. Good for them, huh? With the whole literacy thing. What a what an advancement. Now, once China was open to the globe, they started rising to the world stage. American capitalists were very excited about China's inclusion to the world, world market. They figured that China would be seduced into neoliberal greed and would become a capitalist state that America can control. But China used this to boost their economy and start raising their own citizens out of poverty. In the 80s, Russia's new leader, Gorbachev, decides to reopen relations with China uh, after their feud in the 60s. Seeing this move as an insult, students decided to protest and effectively shut down the Chinese government for seven weeks. This is what led up to the famous Tiananmen Square incident. But there are a lot of discrepancies on what actually happened there. The student in the famous photo was alive and well. He was never arrested by the government for protesting. And this incident was days after any violence had taken place. The student, protester, uh, student protesters had started the violence when the military arrived outside the square by taking arms away from them. And no bystander was actually killed by the Chinese military. But the military did open fire on its citizens in retaliation. I mean, their weapons were taken away, so they had to fight back somehow. But how is that any different than what happened at Kent State or any labor action in the early 1900s or the Black Lives Matter protest or any other protest that has taken place in America over the last century? It's not. So America should just really shut the fuck up before it contorts its brain, its brain into a perma pretzel from all of this mental gymnastics. Now, the 90s is when things really start to turn around for China. At this point, they're making the most desirable products uh, and has basically become the world's manufacturer. Rapid industrialization has taken its toll on China's climate, but this is a consequence of rapid industrialization itself. The same thing happened in the States, UK, India, and so on. So every neoliberal establishment trying to harp on China's climate problem is ludicrous when they haven't fixed their own crises. I mean, for fuck's sake, California has a fire season, right? The southern states have a hurricane season, and that's just in America. If you have seasons for natural disasters, you're a failed state working on becoming a failed planet. By 1997, the last vestiges of colonial control were released when Hong Kong returned to Chinese control from the 100-year UK lease. Basically, this was like the Crown's international gentrification plan. I believe Hong Kong was supposed to become a royal brunch spot. But this was a signal to the world. China was becoming its own sovereign, independent state without the influence of the West. Now, Hong Kong is like China's Puerto Rico, right? They want their own independent independence and are democratic, but still under the control of a world power. It was only after 9-11 that China was added into the World Trade Organization. And this was another controversial decision because capitalists again thought they would fall for the siren call of lady capitalism, but that didn't happen. In order to put more pressure on China, the Obama administration was pushing the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which would have devastated the global working class and made more capitalists very, very rich. And they increased the number of military bases in the Pacific Southeast. This brings us to today and China's Common Prosperity Program under President Xi Jinping. Under this new leadership and growth in China's economy, the goal was to continue constructing a socialist society, and that idea was being pushed forward. In order to eradicate poverty, China decided to look at po the poverty standard under a new lens. So in China, the extreme poverty level is set at the equivalent of $2.30 uh, a day. Um, and this is 
just to let you know, the World Bank uses a dollar and ninety cents per day. So the China standard is actually a bit higher than that. Um, but the Chinese um, uh, approach wasn't just around income alone. I think what's more important to focus is these two other aspects I mentioned: the two assurances, which is that you don't have to worry about food and clothing, and then the three guarantees, which is that you are provided um, basic medical services, free and compulsory education, which in China is nine years. Uh, and then safe housing, and, and they define safe housing as not only the structure of the housing, but that it has uh, safe uh, drinking water as well as electricity. So the actual program itself followed a what's called a multi-dimensional approach to looking at poverty. It's not just about handing out money, and it's not just about your income, but actually kind of the various facets about what produces poverty and what maintains pro poverty. Uh, so according to this um, metrics, you know, the one income, two assurances, three guarantees, uh, the last 100 million people were lifted out of extreme poverty in the last eight years. And that, as you mentioned in the figure of 800 million, that's the last 100 of that 850 million people. And just to get a sense of what that scale, what that number means, I mean, it almost seems too big to understand. It's, yeah. um, it's the equivalent of lifting up the Latin America plus the Caribbean and most of the U.S. combined together. It would be if all of that population was living in extreme <laughs> poverty that was lifted. And so globally in this last four decades, um, China's poverty eradication um, programs actually lifted 76% of the world's uh, poor. So contributed 76% yeah. of the global reduction poverty. If you're a conservative, think of this as getting the boots that you would pick yourself up by. So in order to build infrastructure to do this, China had to figure out exactly what the problem was and how to find adequate solutions to uplift its people. So initially in 2014, uh, 800,000 party members were sent to do that initial household survey like you mentioned. So that's literally going to the countryside, uh, a total of 132,000 uh, uh, villages and counties and knocking on households to figure out each family's income sources. What is their education level? What are the conditions of the housing, uh, like health conditions? And from there, they were able to identify that 100 million people and put it into a national database of uh, people who actually registered in the program. That's the initial phase of identification. Then, as you mentioned, the 3 million people who were sent, of course, they're full-time party cadre, they were carefully selected members, usually with some sort of, um, you know, uh, higher education or some specialization, whether it's in agriculture or in engineering or something that could be useful in the process. Um, and they go and live in these communities for one to three years uh, at a time, full-time. And, you know, even visiting home uh, can be difficult times because they're fully, you know, dispatched to the villages. And we, we also met with a couple of these uh, cadres that were actually involved in, and you see what the daily life looks like. You know, um, the cell phone is constantly ringing. Uh, usually uh, each uh, cadre is actually assigned to one household. And then, uh, the, then these cadres make up a team uh, and each village is assigned a team. And the team is made of not only, not only the people who is dispatched, but also obviously local leaders, uh, local officials, community um, leaders as well, together they form a team that basically follow uh, the progress of, um, of everyone in the village, including those who are specifically registered in the program. Um, and so their basic work is, I mean, it's, it's the, for anyone who's ever done any kind of community organizing work, it's that day-to-day -day stuff. Um, it's, you know, Mr. Wong saying, oh, um, come here, uh, my front door lock is not, is broken. Um, can you come help me fix it? Or it's Mrs. Zhang's son, he's not going to school and she's worried about it. So can you please come over and talk to him and, and like tell him why education is important and can you help us out there? Could be someone's aunt is sick or you know, someone's father lost a job. Um, and so that's the kind of daily role that people were playing. Uh, in addition to creating those plans or helping the families come up with plans to figure out how they can be lifted out of poverty, whether it's through you know employment, through creating agricultural production, creating you know access to markets, a variety of ways that can happen. Now, look, I get it. The second anyone here in the West hears this, they go, "Well, this sounds 
like it's going to get in the way of my rights and my freedoms. All right. What if I don't want to fix locks and help people? OK, so you want the freedom to be a sociopath. Well, buddy, I got an exceptional country you, you should check out that's built on being a sociopathic shitbag and uses a, uh, the, the idea of freedom as an excuse to give up their humanity. Corporations, billionaires, and CEOs are also heavily regulated in China. Due to these regulations, Chinese billionaires actually lost up to 90% of their wealth. But don't worry, you guys, because they're still billionaires. Look, I think if you lose almost everything you have and still wind up being richer than over 95% of the world, then you have too much money. Okay, that's one of those sentences you really shouldn't have to say out loud, but because we live in a fractured reality, you absolutely have to say out loud. The reason why China is an emerging global power that's a threat to imperial dominance is because they use the Communist Party to control private industries. When China opened itself up to the globe, they decided to keep larger things like land under public control. This way, real estate corporations can't arbitrarily spike rent on apartment buildings on land that they're leasing from the government without losing control of their properties. And China also learned from its own mistakes and the mistakes of its rivals. U.S. capitalism tried to achieve social goals through privatization. The social goals being an upward transfer of wealth and putting a price tag on everything from socks to identity to democracy itself. The USSR tried to achieve its goals through public enterprises and funnel more control to the government. But thanks to the paranoia of the nuclearly charged Cold War, both nations focused their economic successes on the military. China coordinated uh, China decided to coordinate public and private enterprises together to ensure that the beneficiary of the profit would be the Chinese people. And guess what? That includes billionaires and the capitalists that live in China. The goal is to create a stable economy without constant booms and busts like capitalism. And they're succeeding. As we mentioned earlier, over the last 30 years, 850 million people have been uplifted from poverty in China. That's 76% of the world's poverty. In America, the number of people that have been uplifted from poverty is equivalent to the number of billionaires this country has. So like eight people, like, like eight people have been uplifted from poverty in America. So I believe monetarily, America has eradicated negative 400% of the poverty in the world. Look, China is far from a perfect country because humans are still in charge, but there's still corruption and greed at every level of their class structure. But the difference is that they're trying to do something about it. America wants people to give into that greed because they've given into that greed and they want everybody else to give into that same greed. But when it's met with a nation that it can't bend to its whims, it throws a temper tantrum in the ways of propaganda. China is proving the adage that sharing is caring is rather profitable. Hey, thank you so much for checking out this video and podcast. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button. Uh, and please make sure that you are subscribed to this channel, whether you are watching this on YouTube or Rockfin or Odyssey or Facebook or listening to the audio version. Please make sure that you are subscribed to receive updates to know when I'm putting out new videos because uh, I put out videos uh, on, a, on a relatively regular basis. Uh, and uh, the easiest way to keep up with everything that I do is by joining my free email list. I send out one email every single Sunday. Uh, that gives you a list of all of the videos and podcasts I've released. And sometimes you get some bonus uh, short stories and real life stories as well. 
Uh, not only that, you can also become a sustaining member making monthly contributions, which gets you a bunch of bonus stuff like uh, bonus stand-up shows, bonus stand-up comedy content, uh, and, uh, and, and bonus videos that, that, that you get uh, from me as well. So there's tons of bonus stuff that you get by becoming a sustaining member. Uh, and you can get tickets to be in the virtual audience of the next Forkful of Noodles recording, which happens on the last Thursday of every month at 8 p.m. All of this information, all of these links are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. I want to thank everybody that, that has subscribed, has liked, has shared all of my content, has become sustaining members. You guys are, are uh, uh, big reasons that, that, sh that shows like this continue to, to be made and the quality of these shows continue to improve. So thank you very much uh, from the bottom of my heart. I really, really appreciate you guys. Uh, but till the next one, take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and we'll see you on the road.